having spent the most impressionable nine years of my life in New Hanover, in the heart of the timber producing area in the province of Natal, South Africa, I grew deeply, well, you might say almost spiritually, attached to the isolated splendor of the dense forests. And I suppose it was inevitable that I would be attracted to seeing my future wrapped up in forestry. During my high school years in Durban, I made application to the Sarsfeld Forestry School located in the Otaniqua mountain forests of the Cape Province of South Africa. The lifestyle of a forester, as I pictured it, was very attractive to me. An isolated cottage and my horse and I totally immersed in the splendor of a natural wilderness. Now, what could be more perfect than that? Now, here's something that may be hard to believe. This fond dream that I had cherished for so many years faded into the background in a matter of a few weeks. How in the world did that happen? Well, it happened in 1957. And here is something I have learned over the years. Most of the dramatic changes in my life have come about as the result of meeting just one person. In 1957, that one person was Bradford Ryder. New Hanover was still important to me, and I spent most of my school vacations back in my old stomping ground. I sometimes brought a friend along for a few weeks. Bradford was a fun person to hang with, so I suggested he join me for two weeks. His answer totally caught me by surprise. He explained to me that he had a commitment to work on an ocean-going freighter called the Border during vacation times. He went on to share that he was a Merchant Marine Officer Cadet. He really caught my attention. I asked a lot of questions about what he did. He asked me if I would be interested in becoming a cadet myself. You bet! See the world and get paid to do it? Such a deal! I shared this with my parents and they were cautiously okay with the idea but wanted more information. A few days later Bradford told me to present myself to Grinrod and Gazzini, a shipping company with offices in the city of Durban in South Africa. They interviewed me and gave me some paperwork for my parents to sign and told me I had been assigned to the coaster named Boundary and needed to report for duty at the start of my school vacation in two weeks time. I thought our departure date would never arrive. Finally, we were sailing out of Durban Harbour, bound for Port Elizabeth, a voyage of about 440 miles that would take us two days. Normally, we admire coastal scenery from the shoreline. It was so different viewing it from the ocean. Standing at the bow, watching pods of dolphin racing the ship was absolutely spectacular. They exhibited so much exuberance, it was so obvious they were having a lot of fun. training orientation was to get a basic understanding of the operation of a ship from the depths of the engine room with its coal-fired boilers to the command center called the bridge. About four weeks into my training I was assigned the 8 to 12 shift or watch as it's called on board. 
up on the bridge at the ship's helm. I was the helmsman, or ship's driver, taking steering and speed directions from Captain Webster, the ship's master. Standing on the ship's bridge, this thought came to mind. Here I was, only 16 years old, and driving a 1,300-ton ship, but, according to South African law, not yet old enough to drive a car. Back in her historic hometown of Peter Maritzburg, Merle, now 14 years old, was a ninth grade student at Russell High. It was during this time that Doreen, Merle's older sister, left home and moved to the city of Durban to pursue a nursing career. This was a traumatic time for Merle. Doreen was somewhat like a second mother to her and someone she looked up to for counsel and guidance. During those difficult years, there was yet another time of fearful concern that cast a dark shadow over Merle's early teenage years. Merle's mother, Ma, was rushed to hospital with a ruptured appendix. For many days the family feared they would lose her. Merle remembers on one occasion, returning from a visit to the hospital, that Pa, overcome with grief and concern, rested his head against the outside wall of the house and broke down and wept. That was the first and last time that Merle ever saw that stern man weep. Ma recovered, but spent many weeks recuperating at home. There were, of course, joyful highlights from those years as well. One of those was the annual visit all the way from Cape Town of Uncle Billy, Aunt Myrtle and Cousin Helga. At some point during their visit, Merle and Helga would spend a week on a relative's farm near the village of Crichton, about 50 miles south of Peter Maritzburg. Or 95 miles if you preferred to travel by steam train. And who wouldn't? of eight siblings, there were always family birthday celebrations to look forward to. It was during this time that one of Merle's brothers, Roy, turned 21 and was officially recognized as an adult. was presented with the ceremonial 21st key, symbolizing the key to the door of the house and granting him the freedom to come and go as he pleased. Those times, some 65 years ago now, hold precious memories for Merle.